Hello and welcome to the Hunter Bond podcast, um, where I get the opportunity to speak to the leaders and key players in the world of finance, technology and recruitment. Um, today I'm joined by Anthony Wheatham. Um, so Anthony is an account director at LinkedIn. Um, so he's responsible for helping recruitment businesses um, get the best out of LinkedIn. Um, but Anthony, prior to joining LinkedIn, spent six years um, in the British Army as an infantry officer. Um, he was deployed on two occasions to Afghanistan and was responsible for leading platoons, planning and conducting um, various military operations. Um, prior to the army, uh, Anthony also spent two years in the recruitment industry um, during the height of the, the 2008 recession. Um, so firstly, Anthony, I guess my first question is, what did you think was more difficult, the uh, cadet training or first six months of recruitment? <laughs> um, so I joined I joined Paige on a uh, on a grad scheme and uh, it was a kind of um, induction of fire in terms of my uh, complete lack of any um, commercial nounce uh, from from Bristol Uni where I read history and um, into uh, into media sales recruitment uh, at Michael Page in in uh, Vic House in London and um, what was harder that or six months in uh, uh, learning to be a uh, member of Her Majesty's <laughs> Government uh, Armed Forces Pro- probably the latter if I'm honest yeah. uh, but largely because I, I then spent two and a bit years uh, piling on more and more weight um, becoming increasingly unfit and uh, and losing kind of lo- losing all sense of um of, of self in terms of in terms of fitness um, right. but but yeah look that both both challenging in their own in their own respects but very 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 different uh, initial six months in both yeah I mean going back to the you know the beginning of your journey so you, you did a history degree at Bristol Uni um how did you get into recruitment did you fall into it like the rest of us or yeah it's such a common phrase isn't it in terms yeah. of, um, sort of oh, I don't know why. never meant to get into recruitment I, I fell into it um I don't know why that is I, I don't know if it's just not particularly well publicized when people are uh, sort of going through going through university or if the fact that a, a sales role is is not top of people's list when they're when they're doing a degree maybe maybe it's that uh, for me I joined Page on the grad scheme partly because my sister-in-law had done that and um, okay. she's uh, about four years my my senior um and in honesty she she'd not particularly enjoyed the sales aspect of a recruitment role uh, and said but look and I think I think you'll like that and um, so go and have a look and I I turned up there thinking that I was going to have a, a discussion with them about some some grad roles and they flattered me in the best way that recruiters do um, into making me think that I, I must be epic if these people that look at uh, individuals for jobs all day every day want me to actually work for them um, and so yeah so that's kind of what led me in, I'd no idea of, um, I've no idea of the word of recruitment at all uh, whilst at uni. And I think I was delighted to know that I was going to leave and then have a job to go into. Only my mates in banking uh, were really in a similar state. Everyone else was was at that. Uh, what what do I do? You know, yeah. unless you've done a vocational degree, there's nothing necessarily obvious for, right, you're going to go down that route. And at that yeah. time, I had no interest in the armed forces. Yeah, it's normally a friend or a family who works in the industry or, as you say, you know, going in to, to look for one job and um, they sometimes see something in you and, and sell you the dream of, of recruitment. Um, was it, was it? I guess, was it more the, the having a job? Initially for you, was it just, you know, I just need to get into a job or did you actually see, you know, opportunity in earning or progression or was there anything in particular that, that you chose? Recruitment? I think I got, I was, I was very much bought in by a, by a grad scheme in terms of, uh the page grad scheme back in the day i've no idea uh, what they operate now mm-hmm. um, but consisted of just a, a slower ramp in in essence and a, and a bit more time and caring taken taken over you because they yeah. they understood that you had no didn't necessarily have any commercial mounts um so was it was it going to be my career no i i, I think so for me, the, the most exciting people that I've come across still don't know what their career uh, is going to look like. And, you know, they're in, yeah. they're in their 60s. Um, I think for me, it was an opportunity. It looked exciting. I liked that, you know, I could plan out for the next couple of years and I could see that there was potential for progression. There was potential for, for a decent amount of earning. Um, and it was it was moving into London. It was moving into into kind of shared accommodation out of out of uni. It was exciting. 
Yeah, no, definitely. That's the great thing about recruitment is that it is, you know, it's in your your own hands, really, in terms of how far you can take it, how much you can earn. And there is always that, you know, depending on the business you're working, but a clear progression, a clear plan and route that you can take to, to actually move up and move forwards. But, you know, the day to day and enjoyment of recruitment isn't necessarily for, for everyone. Um, so, so you spent you know two years um, doing recruitment and then made the decision to get into the army. How did that kind of come about? Yeah, <laughs> Bit of a um, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess it is. Um, I so my one of my really good mates who I was at, at uni with uh, became a an officer in the Marines, um, and he called me up. And if I'm completely candid about it, I was trying to increase my phone stats um and i was okay. i was uh, talking to a mate to uh, to make it look like i was on the phone more because i wasn't working particularly hard that day um yeah. and uh and he was just outside of court with one of his guys who was up for a some sort of driving charge um and he was really bored and i was like that's much more interesting it's much more interesting than what i felt i was doing that day <laughs> you know like i it just it was different and I was ready for a change. And at that point in time, it was a different world and it was a, it was a new opportunity. Um, I don't come from a particularly military family. Um, I didn't have a particularly, I hadn't done kind of CCF at, at school or OTC at, at university. I, I probably laughed at those that were, were working hard whilst I was uh, dealing with a hangover rather than <laughs> rather than kind of getting involved in that in that world it wasn't it wasn't for me um, and then the more I looked into it the more interested I became about the idea of um, going in running a team and having that responsibility and doing something that felt more worthwhile than what I felt like I was delivering at the time and you know you change and like you you kind of chop and change throughout or certainly I find myself chopping and changing throughout in terms of what what motivates what interests and what what drives and what was driving me at the time was was a kind of a slightly more altruistic approach of of going and want to do something that feels more worthwhile and and mm. ticks those boxes it's a, I know it's again very individualistic but what do you think the draws are to a lot of people joining the army is it the the thought of adventure or is it like yeah I, I, I think you can look at you look back at kind of previous previous adverts to see what what do the military marketing campaigns think the raf think you, know, videos, draw, right? you know i'm not i'm not one to, who's going to throw myself into it but they, they do look very exciting don't they and um, yeah and i think they they do play to that excitement you historically when does the armed forces see an increase in applicants when the economy is bad because it, it, it there is a there's an opportunity there that that isn't necessarily in in every area of the country and every um every demographic um but yeah you know you've got the sort of see the world see the world aspect go and uh, do something less ordinary and um, your, your days are are kind of more more varied um for me you know we we were just coming out of iraq going into afghan um i didn't have a huge desire to to go and fight in a war um but was happy that that was a reality that might take place and as a I use the term relative, uh, relatively young bloke was was excited about, you know, the, the possibilities that that might entail and the, the endorphin rush that I unknowingly um, kind of, yeah, and, and foresaw, like, you've no real idea of the, the kind of realities and the complexities of war until you, you sat in them. But, um, but you have an idea and, you know, as a kid, you run around with a with a rifle and it can't be that, that different, right? Um but yeah, so I think for for me it was what was it that that sense of wanting to do something as I say a little bit a little bit more altruistic um, and exciting and different um, and a change. I you know I've done sort of two and a bit years and, and was ready for a change. Do you think there's any misconceptions from the, the general public in terms of people going into army looking for one thing and really it's another based on maybe the marketing or, or the stigma that the the role entails? I think there are loads of stereotypes around the army. Um, mm -hmm. I'll use on. I'll, I'll refer to it when I refer to the armed forces. I mean the army because it's really where my experience is. Yeah. I, I can't really talk to the navy and and RF. Um, uh, yeah, look, it, you've got a marketing piece that that is is trying to push to many, as as in, yeah. as in any role. Um, does that necessary? 
is it going to sell you the fact that, yeah, look, you're going to have to do a decent amount of marching up and down, of cleaning stuff, of, <laughs> yeah, you're going to fire a weapon, but in the back of your mind, you're going to be going, that was quite fun. Oh, there's a lot of carbon. I'm going to have to take off that that weapon. Um, <laughs> the reality. Uh, I really, really don't want to. I, I actually don't really want to find that <laughs> because that's going to be a lot more work, like exactly hours, not. hours of cleaning. Yeah. Um, and or uh, the sort of uh, slightly darker realities of of going away. And actually, you know what? If you're away for six for seven months, what what impact does that have? What does that have mm. on you know young family? Uh, if you've you know you've, you've just got kids and you're going to miss their first steps and uh, that's a big impact um, and so uh, do many people think about that probably not um should they maybe but at the same time you don't really know and understand the realities of something that you're doing mm. uh, in, the, in the same way you know uh, what what did I think my uh, the job of a recruiter was before I went into recruitment well I just you know you just get people jobs <laughs> that, that that's simple is it yeah, yeah, Loads of, yes, but there's yeah, you say there's a lot more levels to it, isn't there? Yeah, exactly um, that, and you, know, you you miss the sort and of the like, clean up and the graph that comes with it, yeah, yeah, yeah all of, all of the above. Like, oh, do you really want that job? Well, yeah, I kind of <laughs> need it to to pay. Like, but, do you really want to find that rifle? Well, yeah, you I, I do that. Make I, sure you hone that skill. You know, part of my role at Hunter Bond is internal recruitment, and you know, we we have a you know a big history of hiring graduates and training some people that aren't familiar with the recruitment industry, and I make sure that in the interview process and the recruitment process that I tell them you know there is a lot of sieving through cvs and and uh you know spending lots of time on linkedin it's not the most thrilling role but you can get the thrills out of it does do you feel i mean again another question for that is what what was the recruitment process into the army like and do you think did they did they actually uh, i guess squish any of their misconceptions during the recruitment process to ensure that they're not bringing people in for the wrong reasons yeah, I should probably have it here that I, so I went in as an officer and um, so I, I went in, I joined when I was 25 um, and um, that sort of training pro- process consists of, uh, you do various testing. So you need to, uh, when I went through, you need to have various, I can't remember what the levels were in terms of UCAS points. Um, and then you would go and do your physical, you do some aptitude tests and then you do a day um, which is called main board where you it's, it's sort of test you for that for that leadership those leadership traits and and can you lots can of you, situational based question and, and that yeah but it. also physical as well so they, okay. they go think of a sort of management away day yeah okay yeah so okay. like get this barrel from there to there without touching the floor you've got two minutes go um and all of that sort of stuff you do in day-to-day world right you know yeah. you you're going for an interview um you need to be there by this time okay so now think backwards so what do yeah. you need you need your suit cleaned you need your tie you need your shirt uh i need a new shirt right so you're gonna need to go out and go shopping what time you're gonna have to leave and all of that stuff you just work work through beforehand and it's exactly that and it's making sure that you've got that sort of ability to think through okay what am i going to need for this task before we get to this task during this task and then ask this, this, this task because during the task like i've got two minutes okay you i need you to give me a countdown every 15 seconds right i need to know how, how long or, or whatever it may be um is there a sort of realities of the realities of the job maybe not there but you can then go and do sort of visits to regiments and battalions and go and have an understanding of, of what is life like day in day out and go and go and have a look at it like you're, you're gonna go and sign up for at least three years so go and understand what's it really look like what is yeah. day in day out and ask the questions I appreciate that you're you know you're still in an interview and um, but go and ask the questions and go and have that level of understanding like what does it really entail what what am I actually going to be doing here and yeah. um, day in day out I appreciate it's not going to be all excitement and joy so like where does it end and, and where's the where's the graph start yeah what would uh so you know you going down the, the officer route more so than maybe the i guess there's, there's lots of different avenues you can take into the british army and, and, and whatnot what what was the what was the actual training like in comparison was it still just as as regimented um because you went to sandhurst didn't you is that right yeah so, yeah that's right so, that like? so your training as an officer and um, everyone leaves sandhurst as a sort of generic army officer um, and then you go off and you do your your speciality or your skills at arms, right? Um, which I'll, I'll explain. So, if you're a logistician, you're an infantry, you're an artillery, but whatever, you're just when you leave Sanders, you've had exactly the same training for a year. Yeah, okay. that's the major difference between you and a um, 
uh, someone going in as a private soldier, or I, I would refer to them as a rifleman, um, Santos is a year rather than 12 weeks basic training. Really? Um, and like, uh, there's a significant, a significant difference there. Yeah. And so basically you would learn your, um, I'll double check that 12 weeks basic training. Um, <laughs> uh, you would, um, you would basically uh, 14 weeks, apologies. You know that when you're like back and someone's going to hear that yeah. and you're absolutely <laughs> going to get torn to shreds. It's, it's not. Um, so look, I think that, what you need to be able to do when you leave Sandhurst is be able to command a group of individuals on operations. So you need to learn faster than basic training um, how to soldier and then the tactics and then the strategy and all of the de- and then all of the management at the same time. So um, your time at Sandhurst will count as, as units towards an MBA because you are doing like yeah world class management and leadership training um, and it's all about like how do you get the best from this individual now you'll start with your okay how do you polish your boots how do you iron a shirt um and all of that that initial training okay now you're marching fine how do you do an attack where there's one of you two of you four of you six of you eight ten twenty 120 whatever it may be right and sort of gradually gradually but build up from fire team to section to come and and so on and forth, or just larger right. and larger numbers but you've got to be competent enough to be able to do that so you will learn both the what's called the pamphlet and um, so you'll learn all of the everything that's written down all of the doctrine that's written down for it's a great writing doctrine the trouble is we never read it um but there's loads of it written um so you need to learn all of that doctrine and understand that doctrine and how to put it into practice yeah, so to lead, you need to understand how to do it as well as such. But even if you're not necessarily doing it on a day-to-day basis, but it's about being able to plan, resource manage, and actually lead the people to to fill to to fulfil the projects that you that you're overseeing. Yeah, again. yeah. And look, does a um, so you leave Sanders as a second lieutenant, and then about a year later you get promoted to a lieutenant. And th- does a lieutenant that is running a pool of vehicle mechanics? need to know how to strip and reassemble the engine of a uh, warrior armoured fighting vehicle. No, of course they don't. But they need to have a vague understanding of, like, yeah. okay, like what's going on there? What's, what's the time frame? Because he's going to be reporting back going, I've only got one vehicle that, that can actually go out the gate now. And I need 10 tomorrow. It's not going to happen. Like, yeah. So uh, I don't know too much of the ins and outs of that. I'm definitely not a vehicle. <laughs> but, um, but like, do you need to know absolutely and do you need to be the best person at something to then be able to lead the team to know? No, I've seen it, in my opinion. Um, it, works, it works it. the other way around as well. You know, the best engineer in the world isn't necessarily going to be the best leader or... or yeah, and the best salesman engineer, isn't the best manager, right? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. this this sounds very transferable to the, to the general world of, of finance and technology we're in. You know, there's technology project managers who don't necessarily know how to code but they don't need to it's about being able to manage projects and at least have a basic understanding of so you so you can do timelines you can you can manage resource and you can manage people in the right way and also get that kind of level of respect i guess you you also need that respect from your platoon or even or, or technology team really to, to ensure they're actually going to go through with the project um that's interesting that's interesting what did you um what, what did you sort of take from sandhurst and then put into practice so you went from sandhurst to your first deployment immediately or is uh yeah not far off it, it's uh so you got your year at sandhurst and uh, sandhurst is like a school it's got three terms uh, and as long as there's no injury and you don't get found wanting then you'll do your three terms and then you'll what's referred to as being passing right. out so commission from sandhurst you then go into your speciality of arms i was infantry so i went off to brecon in wales uh, and dug a lot of hills and did an awful lot of attacks up hills in the in the wet and the rain um was that further training was it or is that yeah so yeah, yeah. Infantry, there's not, there's not a lot of war going on in there. wales i was just thinking there's, there's uh... not there's not a lot of war. there's a lot of training going on there though right. um so infantiers will refer to it as the fourth term of uh, um of sandhurst uh, as far as i can tell the the gunners the artillery go off and and eat cheese and drink port for a for another term um uh, logistics <laughs> i have no idea um like, doubtless they do they do loads of stuff as well we so we 
go and do that. And then we had our final exercise um, in Belize, which had some jungle warfare in it. And then came back from that. I'm an armoured infantry, which means that we use an armoured fighting vehicle to manoeuvre around the battle space more quickly. Um, so we basically, in most simplistic terms, it looks like a tank. People can jump out of it more so than they can a tank. Right. Um, and so you can get places more quickly and then dismount and continue on your operations dismounted or you can remain mounted and you've got that asset as well. And indeed, you can use them both because you have people out, but this this vehicle still got weaponry, right? Right. Um, so I ended up, in essence, a fifth turn um, doing that, which is uh, because five rifles uh, where I was going off to join uh, are an armoured uh, infantry battalion. So I finished my armoured infantry platoon commander battle course that's a phrase i haven't said for many years um and then went and joined my battalion and there uh as in went to where they're based in germany none of them were there because they're all in afghan and have been for a few months uh and i bounced straight from there to afghan uh, and met my platoon um out in an area called nari siraj in helmand province did you choose that route or is it more that there's openings and you apply mixture of the two so when i went through sanders and i'm conscious i think it's changed um you in essence would say i would like to be looked at by these two we refer to them as cat badges so i was in the rifles which is a, a rifles cat badge uh ah, you wherever you left i that's why i gesture out there um so you would say i would like to be looked at by these cat badges by these regiments of course depending on uh background and you're kind of either wheedled out and away from them. So if I wasn't good enough to be rifles in the first two uh, two terms, they'd be like, they tell you in the nicest way possible. <laughs> maybe to put down, well, yeah, I'm in the army, right? Uh, so yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe put down a different preference. Maybe, yeah, okay. maybe you want to go down a different route. Um, I was fortunate in that um, I wanted to join the rifles when I joined the armed forces. Um, and I was deemed to be good enough to join the rifles. So um, I had two preferences uh they both offered me like like university and um, so they both offered me and uh i was able to, to accept my first choice which was oh, nice the yeah. and within that though there were there are well there were at the time uh five regular battalions of of the rifles um and i didn't have a great deal of choice between whether or not i was going to one two three or four or five but was there any difference or yeah there's a massive difference and um, or uh, well, we would perceive there as being a massive difference. So right. five, five is armoured, uh, and none of the okay. others are armoured, um, and they're, they're all fairly different now. So three now is all about. Oh, crikey, I might end up getting it wrong. Armoured is in the truck, what? not necessarily the gear they're wearing, or no, 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 no. You, you all wear body, all wear body <laughs> armour, and all the, most soldiers will tell you they want to wear less body armour because you're not as manoeuvrable, right. or at least thinner, or like your ideal is. A shed load of body armor that's really maneuverable yeah but there's that that sort of weighing up between weight and, and maneuverability um we'll be able to uh, no, so the, the difference between it then 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 but no but legitimately that like yeah. I, I want to be able to get up and out of this hole that i've jumped into because i'm being shot at or do i want to be <laughs> huddled like a, here a beach just while. <laughs> yeah. yeah and that's that and that, that you know that's part of the sort of the, the dynamic between well look we could basically make individuals body uh, like bomb proof they wouldn't be able to move yeah um, and and that's, yeah, yeah that's the that's the kind of issue that you you, you toss up between but yeah so there's a, there is a big difference between one and five largely like when i was there you went from like, like edinburgh or bulford northern ireland germany like they're all, all based kind of different places as well as being different specialities in terms of being light infantry or armored and i was at the extreme of being armored what was the um? I, I was going to touch on this, but what was the the culture like at Sandhurst in terms of was it was it like the movies portray or how do the movies portray? If, oh, Full Metal Jacket, very <laughs> very, very aggressive. But um, what was Not it? That. Yeah. So it, again, I thought this might be one of the sort of misconceptions. Obviously, there's a massive level of discipline and whatnot that people need, but I can. Yeah, and and look, the, the sort of Full Metal yeah. Jacket is is closer to, although not a reality of. Um, sort of your your basic training, your your rifleman, your private soldier, 
going right. through. Um, the what would a, an NCO, so a non-commissioned officer, someone that's been promoted through the ranks, uh, would say that Sandert is all about people drinking, uh, learning how to drink port and eat cheese, uh, and it's very very posh, very public school. So, it's yeah, based the public school it, of the military. <laughs> but like uh, the British <laughs> Army is based on public school, so that's what like it's right. why buildings like military buildings look like public schools mm. because it's from the public school system there are three terms at sandhurst like it it's a public school system i, I live literally about two minutes away from garrison um yeah. which is uh, down by a uh, shoebury in in south mm-hmm. end and it's a uh, old military uh, training base which has been converted yeah. now into a housing estate and you can really see it there it's very uh, you know i go there for my walks because it's, it's very nice you know it does feel yeah. very oxford very public school like around there yeah. Um, and it's all it's all developed on that so like atmosphere at Sandhurst is you I've never come across anything like it like it is it, it's unbelievable you've got first termers who are absolutely exhausted uh running around with sort of three hours sleep a night desperately trying to get <laughs> places on time with all the right kit in all right order knowing that when one of them doesn't have it right or is perceived not to have it right whether or not it is right uh, they're all going to get punished in some way shape or form right we've got people in the second term that are slightly more wise to it but very nervous they're about to go back to being in that kind of initial weeks and then you've got um people in their third term that that really are start, starting to look at things and you're basically having lectures you're looking at things like the morality like the morality of war like mm. what are the where where's the legal status like where where do we sit in a in a legal conflict what is the un construct like how yeah. does this operate and at the same time get there on time make sure everyone's right make sure you've all got the right kick because otherwise someone's getting punished that comes um, yeah yeah um, is, is there a bigger is there a, you know of course there is you know you know you know i'm making ensuring that um, our soldiers and people in the military obviously are aware of uh, you know the 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 conventions and 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 whatnot is there is there a big emphasis ensuring that I mean, it's a silly question, really, but that soldiers are doing war right in a way, yeah, typically. Huge. Absolutely um, huge. Um, so you'll have that training. Apologies, it's, it's raining, so you may hear that through the, through the right. um, um Not only will you have those sort of, like, okay, you've, you've made sure that all of your officers, all of your NCOs and everyone else goes through that sort of level of training, but you've also got then continual military assessments to make sure, that, yes, look, are you, are you fit? And competent but also do you pass the legal and moral understanding of what it is that you're going you may well be asked to do um do you understand where you stand if if we're stood together and someone shoots at you can i defend you if it looks like someone's about to shoot at you where do i stand mm. if it looks like someone's got a weapon and i think they are they might try and like where where Wait, are the line. lines yeah and um, where do we draw if if we know that they are a enemy to us but they're on a beach sipping a pina colada <laughs> can i attack them there <laughs> and, and it's really interesting right because you, you go from the sort of look yeah look, if someone's shooting at the person next to you you could probably return fire like it, that seems to make yeah. sense to everyone that's in essence our our card alpha which is uh phraseology for like you always have the inherent right to act to save a life and you may need to be aggressive to save that life mm. uh down to like some like really quite hostile actions and that that, that person's just there having a pina colada and yeah. you're going, right okay we've got some helicopters good. overhead right <laughs> um, but everyone needs to understand and in particular they, they need to understand where do they sit at that moment in time because it's just it's a sliding scale obviously it's a sliding scale you you you've you, know, you will have seen when, and it, you know, it wasn't British troops, but American troops going in and on Osama bin Laden uh, many years ago. That's not too far off Pina Colada territory, right? It's at home. Um, so, like, you need to understand, well, how are we operating at this time? And all throughout your orders process, which, again, like, officers will learn or start to learn it at, at Sandhurst and develop and, and change their style throughout. Um, like, okay, like during this order process, I'm going to explain to you not only, right, we're going to go from here to here, we've got to do this en route, and this is what we're going to do at the end. These are the timings. This is what you're going to wear. This is what you're going to eat. This is when you're going to be able yeah. to sleep. This is when we're going to be back. But also, these are the rules of engagement that we are operating under. Yeah, you, and, want to, and like, you, you want to eliminate a lot of the, the not necessarily the free will, but the, the you want to make sure that it's... You want to remove you know, doubt. You, 
yeah that's that's you know you want to try and remove doubt as much as possible and at the same time and i i found on my uh on my tours uh so whilst, whilst i was in afghan like you also get into conversations with the guys which are you know if you've had a, a not particularly uh, not particularly fun day uh, a conversation of boss why are we here like you, you've got to be able to answer that you know you've got to be able to keep keep people motivated and keep people moving like, it, again like it's, it's not too dissimilar from from you guys and uh hunter bond continues to motivate the team like oh i've just had you know i just had this this happen that i wasn't expecting which has annoyed me like what is the point like yeah. what are we doing well ultimately we're doing this because you know what you can get people jobs it's going to change their lives that's amazing yeah you're going to get some money from doing it as well and and like you're going to change the way that you speak depending on the person and what their motivation is yeah. um and how they how they operate but um but it's the same idea like you, you need to understand the the construct in which you can work like uh boss i think i'm in trouble because i sent the cv of a candidate to their current boss yeah problem um like that's a construct that we need to make sure that we've trained into you beforehand <laughs> like your rules of engagement say you don't do that um it happens to... so hopefully it doesn't happen as much on the on the battlefield but, <laughs> yeah. um, um, but like you you've got that kind of you can cover off like you cover off that bit in the in your training like that's, mm. it's it's just becomes part of the basics and then you know you you then train in and um, so it becomes muscle memory the the questioning the, the like you know, if someone was sat next to you on the phone and they picked up the phone to a random person they've never spoken to, to before and goes, I've got you the perfect job, the person on their left or right is going to laugh at them because what a ridiculous, like, well, of course that person's going to go, no, you don't, you don't know me. Like, in the same breath, like, we're in the armed forces, we we train in muscle memory for, like, okay, how do you remove a blockage from a from a weapon system? Like, what do you do? You you just learn things that are that are right for the role that you're in at the moment mm -hmm. and how to like okay right innately that's how then I, I i get off it and sometimes you'll you'll learn new tricks as you as you kind of go along and you'll be like oh that's interesting i asked that of someone else and actually i got loads more detail that i never would have found out about what their ideal job is um, so. and i think with recruitment you know a lot of learning is through mistake as you say i think we've all you know, sent the CV to a wrong person or arranged an interview wrong, but I can imagine mistakes in the military can be a lot more costly. So do you, is there still a level of, you know, learn from mistakes or do you have to come, you know, really be very... No, no, everyone everyone makes mistakes. Um, and everyone makes mistakes in, in every role. The, yeah. the, to my mind, a good team is one that learns off each other's mistakes um, mm. and that actually is open and on it. Like, if I look at the teams that I work with in my current world, so like if I look at recruitment teams that I that I work alongside, those that perform best are those that talk. And mm -hmm. they go, not just that, oh, I did this, now everyone's going to laugh at me, but guys, I've been doing this and it's been working really well. Um, and that like the best teams are, are, are not necessarily those that have brilliant people, but they're, they're teams of people that know what each other's strengths are mm. and that go, oh, I'm, I'm really rubbish at this. Actually, that in itself is a line that, that, that certainly army-wise we really agenda. Like, I need to know what you're rubbish at because at some point in time, I'm going to ask you to do something. And if you're not good at it and you're not competent, I need to know now. In fact, I needed to know three months ago. So the same works on a team. Like, if you are not happy, I need to engender a relationship and a manner within the team that means that someone isn't afraid to say, I'm not great at this. Can someone help me mm. without them getting laughed out of the room? Yeah. And it's those teams that have uh, traditionally an, an overly lousy, for want of a better phrase, an overly lousy culture that means that no one learns. So actually what happens, people stay for two years and they go. Yeah. And they go and they go and they go. It's definitely uh, because a, they never learn. It's, it's definitely a culture we've been able to enable at Hunter Bond is that well, what, another one of my roles is also heading up the learning and development of the business. And especially where we were working remotely now, back in office, it was a lot easier for people to tap me on the shoulder and ask for, for a bit of advice or come and help. And, and where I'd get, you know, a couple of taps a day, I don't get phone calls or, or messages about anything. It's really, it's, it's been more difficult for me to actually have to, to, I guess, try and identify skill gaps and knowledge gap and, and actually try and encourage the staff to come forwards with with support or mm -hmm. concerns or things that go wrong. And I think too many people are worried about, 
the implications of a mistake and trying to bury the mistake rather than admit it, learn and move forward. Or they're not, they don't know how to get the best out of a tool. So they don't use the tool rather than actually just asking the question of, well, how can I get the best out of this? And I think, you know, especially as leaders, um, it is to give them the, the, the comfort and, and knowledge that, you know, and no, no question is a bad question or, or no support or training is, 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 is silly to come forwards for. And that's, that's definitely, as you say, I think I've been in other environments where maybe it's a bit more of a laddie culture and it's a little bit more sink or swim and whatnot. Um, but yeah, the collaborative supportive environment, especially, you know, new recruiters coming into the industry today. Um, I think they actually, you know, they actually you know, do a lot better and succeed a lot better through encouragement and support rather than the, the, the sort of vindictive nature of the, what recruitment is kind of used to be. Yeah. And I think that leadership, that leadership element that you, you touched on there, that's, that's the key, right? So I, um, I do a decent amount of trying to get help people out of that are tr- planning on leaving the armed forces into civilian employment. But you know what? They've been told what to do over and over again. That's boring. Let me tell you what mistakes I made. Cause then I'm more approachable. Like, of course I've made mistakes. Like make a lot of mistakes, like get things wrong. Um, and if your leadership is able to say, I did a stupid thing. And I really don't want anyone else to do this stupid thing. Um, and I can kind of swallow it. Or like, guys, I've noticed that we as a team are making this error. Like, if you turn it from that, like, we as a whole, we're not getting this right. From you lot, I don't know how many times we've sat through this, we've done this, you lot aren't getting it. No, 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 mate, that's on you. Yeah. Like, your team, <laughs> we. If a, if, if, a whole classroom, if a whole classroom is failing, then it's, you know, it's, it's most likely the I, teacher's ability to teach. Um, yeah, also yeah potentially, right? The, and the individuals. There's, but, there's that, like, I, I remember really clearly as a kid, I remember one of my mates were like, everyone is, be small, but everyone is being an idiot. Like, every, everyone is being an idiot. No one else gets this, right? <laughs> everyone, look at yourself, mate. Look at yourself. It's like, if, if um. If you can't work out who the idiot is at a party, it's probably you. <laughs> um, so, like, so just with that leadership of the team, like the the bits that I have been able to pull through armed forces and, and leadership there into back back into civilian world, and like just the same person that I was when I hmm. when I joined. I've maybe seen lots of different things that I would have done if I got another route. But like, it's that. It's about understanding that a to me re- realistically and recruiters are very good at this like job title means nothing like i don't i don't care if you're the ceo you're still a person um you're still just uh, if you're anything like me you're still just as annoyed with how the um dishwasher drawer is laid you're still like irritated to find your children's socks everywhere or whatever it may be like you're still a person so you're still fallible so you still have those issues so like let's remove the annoying like Oh, I'm I'm the big I am. Mm. Let's remove the shouting because you know what? In my life, I really, really just want a relationship where I'm able to to talk on level and we can all get gains from. Like, there's no point being combative with me. Like, I've done yeah. that well. Like, we don't need a finite winner. Um, rather, like, you can work with your team to be like, okay, guys, like, this is how we can get there. Let me express my fallibility so that I can encourage you guys to do it in the same way that when we talk and we've spoken previously about sort of best practice LinkedIn wise, like if you're pushing out your brand and you want the team to push out their brand, you want like, why is someone pushing out any content? Well, well, boss, when did you last write an article? Yeah. (laughs) When when did you lead the way? Like it's all well and good telling people to do it, but if you can, you ask at the start, do you need to be the expert in like, do you need to be the expert to lead? No, 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 absolutely not. Absolutely not. But demonstrate willing. Yeah. And, and and show that ability that or that understanding in in what might might get people there yeah yeah definitely paving the way and i think i've gone well i've been in recruitment for seven years and i've got a list of mistakes that i've made gut-wrenching mistakes and um i tell them all throughout my induction training and, and the training <laughs> sessions we have and in the hope that they don't make the same mistakes and i think you know especially I, and i can imagine this is very important in, in the military but recruitment especially is it's not you're allowed to make mistakes you just can't keep making the same mistakes you need that you need that gut-wrenching feeling that you get from that mistake to really set in and i'm so so careful with with everything i do now um 
just because of, of trying to avoid that gut wrenching feeling again. And I think um, if you can, if you can, you know, help people to to avoid them, um, then then yeah, you'll be in the best possible leader. But um, yeah, I don't I don't know if it. I'm I'm insanely dyslexic, um, and what that means for me is that I've learned skills that I need to utilise to get me around that. Like that means that I need to note stuff down, but it will annoy me beyond belief if I'm training someone, they've asked a question, I'm training them, they're not bothering to make notes. Because mm-hmm. they're not going to take it all in. Uh, and you're like, okay, well, for starters, you're being rude. But also like, I, I'm more than happy for someone to ask a question, potentially ask that question twice. Don't ask it three times because now you're wasting my time. Like be able to then draw on the resources that you've created um, in whatever manner you want to do, like ridiculously as a child, I learned everything in song or rhyme. Super annoying if I'm learning a new skill. Um, <laughs> but like, but like, I know I appreciate that some some people can just look at someone talking and they understand it mm. permanently in their brain. I've never met anyone that could do that, um, but I I appreciate that maybe a thing. Um, but like, yeah, again, I think that's the you're, you're absolutely right about the make mistakes. Like, we're all gonna make mistakes. Like, just learn from them, keep asking yeah. questions and learn from other people. Then you learn more quickly, right? Yeah, on the notes thing, especially, I mean, I, I would take notes for our training session, but, you know, whether you go back and, and read them or not is, is another thing. But I, I always find just the process of writing it down helps it sink in a lot more. Um, but yeah, that is, that's why I always any of my training, I always back it up with documentation um, as well so that people can come back to it. But whether they ever come back to it as well is, is another question, really. Of course. Um, so yeah, so so touching on um, so your so what is it two thousand and twelve? You've you've been deployed to to Afghanistan. What was your your role and responsibilities at that point? You said about leading the the armed um, infantry. Did you have a large platoon at that point? Yeah. So my my first job was was as a platoon commander. So I had about thirty uh, riflemen. In wow. my platoon, we were split amongst two locations. So in essence, I looked after one multiple of circa 15 and um, platoon sergeant looked after another multiple of a similar number uh, and your platoon sergeant is just this amazing wealth of experience that has been promoted up from rifleman lance corporal corporal right. sergeant like they've been there for years and whilst you've gone and done all the tactics and you've got the pamphlet and you know that you're pretty fresh out right yeah yeah, okay. You've got this. You've got this other person there. That's <laughs> so you're book smart, and he's 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 got the exper- he's got the experience. Perfect. Yeah, perfect example. Um, and uh, so yeah, so that was that was that first tour, and um, you know that we we did what we needed to do. Nice. Did you le- what, what what did you sort of learn from your first tour in terms? So you so you you then went on your second tour. Was a lot of experiences that you were able to take from that first tour that helped you in there. Yeah. Look, first tour was is was an unbelievable, unbelievably steep uh learning curve uh in terms of about self and understanding where your stress points are uh where your sleep points are when you need to rest uh i used to i used to have one of my riflemen who, whose job it was to go boss have you eaten today and when did you last sleep uh, because because you're busy and you just mm-hmm. you just keep you just keep going um and uh what did i learn I probably learned, as with everything, right? I, I, I probably learned more about myself than, than mm-hmm. anything else. Um, it's, it's, we, always, it's a very high pressured environment for sure. How, how is, what sort of coping mechanisms did you have to sort of manage the pressure? Was it just a case of just keep working on to the next one? You did, you, you, yeah, uh, largely on keep that tour. So that, um, it was really interesting. I, so I short toured because, you know, I took over from someone whilst we were out in Afghan on 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 that Eric and um you decompress in Cyprus which is basically a chance to go and swim in the sea and play on inflatables whatever it may be and uh I slept for two days on the beach really and I was like just <laughs> had no cool. concept of how tiring three months being on permanent 100 percent in mm. terms of like your level of alertness, like I would sleep next to the radio um, in the operations room in our checkpoint. And, you know, the, the tri boundary area was like, and in, you'd find a bomb every day. 
is in in its most simplistic form like every single time really? we went on a patrol we would either find a bomb and go oh there's a bomb there let's call someone in and get rid of it or the vast majority of the time you're marking and avoiding it because if you deal with every bomb you're not going to do anything you're not going to be able to to make <laughs> a change mind sweeper. Yeah. you just you spray paint it and you walk around wow um and you do that day in day out day in day out um because like my goal is like my mission for that day and the mission that I've given to the to the team is not let us go and find a bomb. The mission is let us go and find the bomb maker and let us go and destroy the bomb making factory. Well, to get there, I've got to get I've got to go various different routes. You spend an awful lot of time kind of up to your waist in water because it's quite hard to lay a bomb in water. Um, but um, but that's, 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 that's an interesting mentally thing. tiring. It's an interesting take you can take away from from that into the corporate world is that when you've got you know a job at task um but there are minds throughout your process of getting to that end goal that sometimes it's you don't need to just firefight every time but you find quick solutions around to ensure that you keep your focus and attention on the one goal that you have in mind which hopefully will eliminate more minds in the future um it, it's really valid i've noticed a lot of people uh so lockdown lockdown's changed a lot right um we don't need to go into that. But what I have found interesting is I have a decent number of conversations with CEOs where I go, have you, have you turned off your alerts yet? And the vast majority of them have now turned off their alerts on their emails and on their phones because otherwise they're 100% reactive. Mm-hmm. And you've, you've got to drive a business. You've, you've got to get it somewhere. So like I, I'm really dyslexic, right? like something shiny appears over here in my screen i'm gonna look at it I'm definitely gonna look at it so i've got to turn it off yeah so i just turn it off and i just i schedule time like that is when i'm gonna call people back that's when I, i'm gonna accept calls like you want to talk to me now no i am doing something else i am because i have i have the goal that i'm working to um exactly the same exactly the same concept um i think people found that very very difficult because you'd lost the distractions of sitting next to everyone i sit next to a guy called tony when whenever we're in the office my favorite game at the moment is putting or was putting a can of full fat lilt and a chocolate bar on his seat so that when he came back he would eat it i'd find that hilarious he would get larger and larger <laughs> fantastic um but like but that's it's a distraction prank, right? but it, yeah yeah it's, yeah well yeah it's like it so it's, it's free oh, snack, free. <laughs> um, but like you like that, that's an ent- it's, it's entertainment for you, right? It's a distraction. And you don't have them so much at home, or I don't have them so much at mm-hmm. home. Um, so you can just work and work and work and work, but actually not being productive if you're just like, okay, mm-hmm. reactive, reactive to, to people all along. No, let's, like, you've got, to, you've got to work to that strategy. You've got to have that end state, that mission, that goal that you're working to and your route there. And yeah, of course, you're going you're gonna to divert. And like, it's not going to be a straight line that gets you there. You're going to have to deal with other stuff as you go. Yeah. But ultimately, yeah, yeah. yeah cool. like, I mean, in the same way that if you were going to a meeting, you might go, yeah, I do want to talk to you about that, but we're going to have to walk and talk. Like, do the same. You just yeah. can't do the same with an email. Yeah. I would say about being adaptive is, is, is obviously very important, but also being focused is, is highly important. But I, for me, it's always, if I had to turn my emails off, is the, I've, I've done it for this session, but of course you would for, for any meeting. And you can kind of use that same mentality for blocking out tasks, but it's the fear of missing something or fear of not reacting to something important. Um, how do you sort of advise that though to, to leaders? It's, it's, I was talking to, I, I have a, a coachee, um, who I'm working with at the moment, who's, who's great and brilliant. And at the start of any coach coachy agreement, we, we set out our, our coaching agreement, right? Our, our contract. Um, and within that, I will always go to, I'm like, I am really easily distracted. I'm going to talk to you on zoom at the moment or teams or whatever it is. So to that end, like my phone is here. Like mm. you need to see that my phone is here and I'm going to show you my phone is behind me at all times. Because if it's not there, then there's that danger. Your drift, yeah. There's that date. Like, I, I keep it turned around. But I, I make that point and, and make it large to go, I'm in the room and I'm fully present with you. Like, I'm as present as I can be. Because, like, how insanely rude would it yeah. be in a normal meeting to be like, oh. <laughs> like are you kidding me? I, I made the mistake of wearing uh, my iWatch for today's session. So I've had my wrist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every you, once in a while. I've just not looked at it. <laughs> but all you want to do is look at it. Like, our worlds are, are so, like, dominated by tech yeah. and I, I, it's really interesting my before i 
Going to LinkedIn, I worked in a project management consultancy for about six months. Uh, and we were working on the uh, what Sainsbury's should do, whether or not they should acquire Nectar. They ended up acquiring Nectar. Um, but should they run their own old scheme? What, what should they do? And um, I used the line once, uh, and you can't use it again once you've used it once. Uh, and it's your kind of nuclear option where um, the boss I was working with was having a hard day and they were finding everything unbelievably stressful. And that's fine. That happens. Uh, and I went anyone hurt anyone dead no fine should we carry on um and like look it's an extreme focus but uh we, we have a housemate here uh, who works in clothing and you know some days you're like you know what it's just sports clothing <laughs> that's what we're working with yeah. in the recruitment world you know what it's just a target yeah you you've got to hit it but grand scheme yeah it's just a target like if you do everything that gets you there, you're going to be pretty close if you're not actually there. Yeah. Like, yes, of course, we want you to hit your target. Of course, everyone wants you to hit your target. Of course you do. But some days you don't. Yeah. Why? Breathe and do that. Like, don't take, don't take the nuclear. Don't take the, like, anyone hurt? Anyone dead? That's the thing about yeah, recruitment, no, especially, I think, you know, the, the, you, you look at the why well, the big picture is I need to hit this yearly target, but the best way you can do it is breaking yourself down into smaller tasks and giving yourself rewards for achieving them smaller tasks. You know, okay, today I didn't send a CV, but you know, I was very active. I sent this many messages or I've done this many calls, which the numbers generate, you know, results. And I think that's the same for, for anyone who's in a business where you've got these long-term goals and aspirations, but what you need to do in terms of planning to reach these goals and aspirations is to break it down into smaller, more achievable targets to hit and, and get, take that satisfaction and that reward from from hitting them smaller targets otherwise you're going to drive yourself crazy constantly thinking about the the end goal which is my, which later down the road my mentor at, at michael page um ended up being the reason that i joined linkedin um and i'll come back to that in a second but when he used to sit on the phone he used to do my head in he'd sit on the phone for an hour to a candidate who wasn't a candidate they weren't actively looking he was just just talking to them about okay what's going on in the market who's looking what you're doing what's happening in your, with your business cool use me as an advisor i talk to other people like makes sense right I mean, and you guarantee he would pick up a candidate or a client from that call every time every time he's talking to them. Know, once fortnight but he had hundreds of them um and because his process was if i talk if i don't talk to people i'm not going to hear anything mm. do i need a reason to talk to someone possibly but i could pick up the phone and go hi we haven't spoken for a while what's yeah. going on how are you what's going on in your world um i use it as an example because of like yes it's it's little steps but sometimes just break just break what you're doing with a cool i'm going to use like i can use one of my joker cards which is i'm going to call joe blogs uh because joe blogs is always good for a chat and you know what? It'll energize me back in with something else. Or I'm going to call up Lee and we're going to have a laugh for five minutes because I need a break. And I'm just stuck here. I That sort of longer game. Look, I um, when I left the Force, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I wanted to go into project management because I wanted to manage people. I'd manage people. I'd manage projects. It seemed to make sense to me. Mm. Um, and uh, it was my old mentor at, at um, Michael Page was then a manager at LinkedIn and tapped me on the shoulder. Now, he tapped me on the shoulder because when we worked together six years prior, I'd worked hard and I'd networked and proved that I could do the job mm. and that I could do a sales job. I then spent six years not doing a sales job. Um, but it it comes back. like The work that you put in here, no matter what it is, it does come back to roost. All of my work is around relationships and about, okay, guys, we've tried this. It worked or it didn't work. This is this is the next thing. Mm. This is the next thing. This is the next thing. And uh, everything that I do is about trying to get an increased return on investment. The clients have to increase the investment to be able to continue to see that. But you have to therefore have the trust that says, "I know this works. Mm. I've done it. You're going to have to take that leap." Um, and sometimes that takes time and takes yeah. a lot of time. And the same with recruiters. Like you can get lucky and win one job you might or might not place it or you can get yourself to be the preferred supplier 
and win all of their jobs. And you do that through the relationship build and yeah. through the conversations, through the chats. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Oh, yeah, I was talking to you about that job. I'm so glad you asked. Of course we do. We've got another three jobs coming up on this other team. Oh, you haven't met Bob, but let me, like, all of that route. And I, a lot of that is lost when people are just like, I must do this, I yep. must do this, I must do this, I must do this. Yeah. So, yeah, look, keep your journey. But let some of those those sidetracks kind of take you down. And I think they'll enjoy the job a lot more as well. You know, I think yeah. just being so focused on, I need to get a CV, I need to get a CV. Well, rather, you know, people, when I speak to recruiters about what they like about the job, it is building the relationships with people and, yeah. and developing a network and a candidate. And and it's not always about what am I going to get today, but it's about, you know, six months, a year, two years, and, and it will all, you know, one candidate next, you know, next, ne- next month, another, another person you've been chatting to for a year. Um, but you'll get a lot more enjoyment out of the actual job itself by taking an interest in, in people and their lives. Um, I think so. And we, we talk a lot of LinkedIn about uh, look, our goal is to bring economic opportunity to the workforce. So what? Like, what an amazing position to be in, to be like, we help people grow and develop their, their yeah. lives, their careers. Amazing. You guys literally on the cold face chatting to someone, I have got you a job starting here tomorrow. Let's celebrate. What an amazing place. There's nothing, there's nothing better. That's, there's, yeah. it, and, you know, especially with the market that we were in, it's, it's high end. So it's a lot more quality over, over quantity. So when them deals do come about they are extra special they've taken you know months of of the vigorous interview process working with you know elite hedge funds and quant funds our candidates are um are over the moon a lot of the times because of the sort of salaries we can we can we can get them as well so it is a really satisfactory you know satisfying role especially where where we're at um so you're so, so you so you went from so you went from the military what was your decision to 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 leave the military and go back into a corporate environment yeah so I did that first tour, then we did the Olympics, then I did a second tour of Afghan, and somewhere in there became a jungle warfare instructor, and somewhere in there got promoted a couple of times. So I was a, so I left as a as a captain, um, and as a, a company two IC, which means company second in command, which basically means a deputy head of a school, if a school is a company size and has about right. 20, 140 people. Um, my flippant answer to that is always you can only miss so many birthdays, weddings, christenings, right. funerals before it all gets a bit tiring. Um, and yeah. the reality, I think, was a mixture of that. Um, I was ready for something new. Um, I'd done two tours. Um, I've done quite a lot. I, I'd, I'd seen enough. I'd done it. <laughs> Look, there are a decent number of people that do 22 years in the armed forces and I turn yeah. the hat off to them. Um, I, you know, me saying I did six and uh, sort of woe, woe is a bit like bore off and that's that's like 22 years is a very different different world. And there's loads of stuff that you can do. You could, could have gone a completely different route. For me, it was just time. Um, I I was ready. I was, I was lucky that I'd done a lot of things that I'd wanted to do. I got a lot from it and... Yeah, I was, I was ready for, I was about to say I was ready for the next adventure, which is one of the most painful things <laughs> to come out of my mouth. But I was ready to see what else was next, right? And and to go, go on, as I said, like, for me, recruitment wasn't career for, did I think military was for a short period? And then it wasn't. And, you yeah. know, I, I'm very happy to to kind of see what I can get from life in terms of yeah like, it's, it's 80 yeah, percent of your day doing work it's right? what you want to get from from life isn't it and i guess yeah. you know you, you know i, I say military is maybe a, 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 a young man's game but you say people are there for, for 22 years but i guess you know certain people's priorities and, and what they want out of life change. that's what you consider um, young though if you join at 16 and you've been in there 22 years yeah. you're not far off my age <laughs> yeah. now yeah. <laughs> so. true. yeah it's true so how did you um obviously someone like yourself who you know has has you know, there seems to be a good amount of sort of transferable skills from from the role that you did in terms of project management, leading people. How, I mean, for people that may be in more, I guess, you know, infantry type positions and whatnot, how do you see them them adjusting from military world yeah. to to corporate world? And and thank you for asking. And um, that like, I'm glad you asked. Is I think it's quite it can be can be relatively challenging. So, for clarity, like my job description was to close with and destroy the enemy. 
Like it doesn't overly translate into into uh, the corporate yeah. world. Like we can jokingly go, well, you know, it's sort of no, it doesn't. No, it really doesn't. Because when I mean destroy, I'm, I mean destroy. Um, yeah. So, but within that, I've done loads of stuff, right? Like you've run teams, you've run adventure training, you've run projects to make sure everyone is hitting their KPIs. Sound familiar? Like you know you. You've got targets to hit. You've got deadlines to hit. You're looking after X amount of equipment worth X amount of money with X number of personnel. Get it down because that is immediately transferable. The Armed Forces is, is the only organization that I know that will uh, work with you to help you find another job afterwards. Only other employer. Um, so in, in, what, going, in what way do they help? Yeah, so they'll give, so there's, transition partnership there is uh, the ability to do things like a prince two qualification to do an mba to do okay. you know uh, city and guilds qualifications whatever they may be whatever you want them to be really you just got to find the qualifications and they're going to help fund fund that dependent on your time like how long you've served for mm. depends on how much money you get really realistically um but it i think it can both be a a challenge to move and less of a challenge than people think it is. So um, there are a lot of stereotypes for those that have, that have served. Um, when I turned up, they won a, a oh, I'm, I'm a scruffy man. I was a scruffy man when I was in LinkedIn. I am still, as when I was in the army, I'm a scruffy man in LinkedIn. Uh, when I turned up day one, uh, someone told me that they'd shine their shoes, especially because they knew that a, a soldier had arrived. And you go, ah, <laughs> you know what? And that's not the only stereotype you're going to have yeah Hi, and like that's the one you've chosen to share with me and i kind of need you to get rid of it because you know what i'm probably not going to hit the floor if there's a loud bang um and i'm not going to sit here shaking at my desk um and i'm not you know I, I don't have ptsd so let's let's just work through all of the other stereotypes and work out what's not here nor am i going to just shout at you to get something done like i am an individual that has done this as a career previously or has done this as a job previously and there are lots of those stereotypes that do fall in and you know I, I wrote a piece a while about the, the, something around like ni- neither hurt nor a hero. And the vast majority of people that live the armed forces don't fall into those brackets that tabloid press want, want us to fall into. Like oh, you're either a, either a hero that did this mm. or you're hurt either mentally or physically. Well, actually most people sit here and yeah. uh, have just learned some stuff. Yeah. They've gone and done a job. So Yes, look, if you've joined when you're 16 and you're leaving when you're 38 and you've never interviewed realistically for a job because you've got jobs because you're best placed by assessment from board or you've got the right qualifications and you're at the right place, right time, Mm. are you going to find it challenging to be interviewed? Yes. Of course you are. It's a a new skill. Yeah. So what can they do? You can start on Google, um, look it up. There are an awful lot of companies that have signed the Armed Forces Covenant and they are say, they say pretty much what they like. But in essence, we support people leaving the Armed Forces and their families. Mm. So go and ask them for an interview. Go and ask them for practice. Go and describe why you can do this project manager job to an auntie that knows nothing about the Armed Forces. Nephew, whatever it may be. Um, I always describe the armed forces as being similar to a school because people get schools. So I was deputy head mm. of a school. Right? Um, the construct's not too different either, uh, as we as we mentioned. But in terms of the the things that people find hard, are not too dissimilar from anyone else interviewing. Right? You will have had interviewees that are rubbish at interviewing. Say panic under pressure, yeah, or like yeah. they just say the wrong thing. But you know what? If they were met in the pub, they'd probably get the job. Wherever it may be. Um, we just we just need to teach people these skills. So you yeah. just need to understand, okay, what's going on here. Also, they need to be able to uh, translate the stuff that they have done in the military context. Often, I will read someone's CV or LinkedIn profile and go, I neither know, understand what you have done in a military or a civilian context. Help. Like, yeah. I, I should be able to get this, and I don't. Um, and that's just about education around. Like, stop using all the buzzwords under the sun. I'm not having that you know what you did. Um, so, like, come on, let's let, let's just work around that. Do, do you know? Any, like, so, you mentioned there's some, I guess, associations that specifically help um, veterans with these kind of um, 
like CV construction and interview techniques? Is there actually any association that do that or is there recruitment companies that do that? So it's both. Um, I'm not going to list off a lot of yeah. recruitment firms. It doesn't, doesn't seem quite fair in this, in, yeah. in this context. There are military, there are ex forces uh, specific recruitment okay. consultancies. Um, there's Just also... Googling it and, and having a yeah. chat with a few people. But they'll also be steered that way. Yeah, they'll they'll also be steered that way anyway. So like when you leave, cool, you now need to go and talk to RFEA, which is a um, a charity that that Mm. helps. Um, Or the officers association, whatever it may be. Um, Yeah, use LinkedIn. My my best advice is go and connect to people and go and find out what jobs are really like. You asked a lot at the start, like, what's it like? in the army was it what you thought it would be ask that question when you're leaving Mm. what's it really like to be a recruitment consultant what's it really like to be a project manager management whatever it may be like find someone that you know that has left that's gone on to do it use the connections you've had yeah use the relationships you've had go go and find out I think it's it. Yeah. So there's a, there's a couple of things to really take from this. It's, it's not only, I guess, employers, but also the people, you know, outside the military who maybe need a little bit of education around the, these, you know, the stereotypes of, um, you know, of people coming out of the military and what, and what sort of personalities they are and what skills they have to offer. Cause it's going to be different for absolutely everyone. So I think that's really important that we, we, we try and eliminate them stereotypes, especially in the hiring process as leaders um, and actually give people opportunities to, about what they, what they've done, what skills they have, what experience they have and what, you know, who they actually are as people um, rather than, than, than this, this sort of blanket um, that we, that we might potentially throw over the industry. But, um, but yeah. And, and in a case of, I think, people coming out of the army yeah they themselves also have to do that that research and, and understand well what skills do i have you know what what can i take away from the army and i guess there's associations they can they can speak with and hopefully they can find a career where they can leverage off of the skills they have but also their interests um yeah and i look i think i think you raise a, it's, it's such an interesting point around stereotypes and amazingly the world is better about trying not to or i hope it's better uh, trying not to pigeonhole people for whatever reason mm. be it you haven't got a degree or you're of ex ethnicity, gender, sexuality, yeah. whatever it may be, right? It's just another one to be aware that you may yeah. have that that sort of unconscious bias around that. That like it's definitely something that's n- I've never heard discussed in the diversity discussion circles, which maybe yeah. kind of should be. But yeah, anyway, and I think it's it's the the question I get asked about, I get asked most often is, was it hard leaving the armed forces? And actually the real question there is like, because you know, you no longer have your security blanket or like, are, mm. are you okay? It, it could easily be to like, are you okay? Are you safe? Or are you, have you got various mental are you hero uh, stress? Uh, sure. Yeah. And, and you know what? Like, poor off. Like, um, I, I completely get that it's coming from a good place. I completely get that. And, you know, it's a nice question to be asked. Um, my answer tends to be, I was a civilian for a lot longer than I was in the army. I'm, I'm 36 and I served for six years. Like, come on. <laughs> like, yeah. I, can, I, I hope I can work reasonably well in the, in the normal world. The, the, um, the, the challenge is that there are a decent number of people that are coming out that have spent most of their life in a military context and that that do in essence need a google translate to 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 when they're they're telling you about you know their their trip trip to the uh to the coffee shop on camp and they're talking about yeah i'm just going to go down the nappy and back and you're like like that because that's (laughs) that's their world and that's what they talk about um i'm sure a lot um, of the terminology in in the financial world is going to be you know it's exactly exactly that and there are quite a lot of uh i know for my client base i I know a decent number that have got ex-forces um as recruiters that that sit in there and you know how do they do as well as anyone else from any other background that you you choose to pigeonhole together yeah that's great um well no thank you so much for your time today is there anything that you wanted to to to, to leave on at all anything that um no, I, I hope I haven't bored you. Uh, I'm, I'm no, it's actually been really I, interesting. And, and to be honest, I, 
I don't have any knowledge of the the, the military world, and 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 it's been, it's actually been quite enlightening to me, and it's probably ch- it's changed a lot of the way I sort of thought of things as well. Because I too, and unfortunately, you know, would 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 have that you know stigma, I think, of of expecting someone to be highly disciplined, or as you say, with the the, the boot shining and comment that you've had previously. And I I, you know, I could even fall into that sort of category, but it's it's really opened my eyes, and I think a lot of people will will, will hopefully respond well to this for sure. Um, but no, thank, thank you so much for your time and um, yeah, we'll, we'll speak again soon thank you so good to chat to you cheers, cheers Andy. bye